Uh, our our guests are uh, are going to be uh, Adrienne Hines from from uh, Tencent, a principal researcher, Andrew Fear, senior product manager, Nvidia. Greg Jones, Senior Manager, Cla uh, CloudXR at NVIDIA, as well as Dijem Penny Grahi, uh, Co-Founder and CEO of GridRaster. Okay. Good morning or good day, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Ariane Himes, and um, I'll be uh, moderating the panel uh, in the next for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Uh, I'd like to just take a minute to uh, go around and have our panelists introduce themselves. Um, I'll start with myself first. I am a principal researcher at Tencent. My background is in image and video compression. I participate a lot in the MPEG group, and I'm uh, also uh, studying immersive media and the distribution of immersive media from the cloud. Uh, so, Dijim, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dijim, uh, co founder and CEO of uh, uh, Grid Raster. At Grid Raster, we are building a, a, a scalable, high performance uh, cloud based uh, platform for mixed reality uh, by leveraging the distributed edge computing and 3D AI and currently working with some of the top uh, enterprise customers in aerospace and defense, uh, automotive and uh, uh, tel telcos uh, uh, and to enable some, some of the end user uh, game uh, use cases like gaming and live sporting events, et cetera. Yeah, love to talk more. Great, Andrew? Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Fear. I'm a senior product manager of uh, GeForce Now at NVIDIA. Um, I've been at NVIDIA about 20 years now um, and I'm, I tell by my white hair. <laughs> and uh, I've worked on a lot of uh, um, immersive gaming technologies at NVIDIA, uh, cutting edge technology like NVIDIA SLI, which was combining uh, mul multiple graphics cards together for higher performance gaming, uh, work on our 3D vision technology, which was a uh, stereoscopic 3D for games. Uh, and now I've been working on GeForce Now, which is our cloud gaming service uh, for about the past seven, eight years. Awesome. And Greg. Hey, good morning, I'm Greg Jones. I'm a senior manager of global business development for XR at NVIDIA, and I also manage the Cloud XR package that uh, we recently announced and, and actually gave a talk on, I think yesterday, the talk aired here on AWE. So glad to be here. Okay, so thanks, gentlemen. And um, so just a, a little bit of a overview of our panel uh, today. We are talking about delivering uh, gaming and XR experiences from the cloud. And as a reference, uh, we'll just, you know, think about where we were maybe a decade or so ago where everything was pretty much um, rendered, all the processing for delivering those types of experiences was done locally, you know, at home. And so the challenge is moving all of that into the cloud so that the clients maybe aren't quite as complex and we can also make them mobile. And um, so uh, I think what I wanna do is open up with the question of, um, are we there? Are we able to um, actually replicate the in-home local experiences by uh, putting all of that processing into the cloud? Anybody wanna take me up on that question? Well, I'll take that one up because uh, we've uh, <laughs> we're cut on the cutting edge part of that uh, doing uh, gaming now. So, you know, about, probably about ten years ago, at Nvidia, um, we started looking at the cloud for rendering for graphics as kind of solving a problem, which was we had engineers that wanted to test drivers, but they didn't want to walk over to the lab to actually log into the machine physically. They just wanted to do it remotely to bring up their graphics drivers and see if it all worked. And so, um, one of our our senior architects, uh, our principal engineers started developing this technology to actually stream, remotely stream the entire desktop back to his desk. So they always say, what is it, um, you know, uh, necessity is a mother invention. I mean, it could have been laziness as a mother invention. And when he first started doing it, you know, he, he came to the conclusion that he could actually remotely stream the graphics and get pretty good performance, um, but he still felt like he could do a lot more. And so 
we've started all this time in investing more technology, um, trying to do uh, better compression and coding technology in the graphics, faster rendering, faster encoding, um, and also working with telcos and other service providers to lower the overall latency. And at this point, for a wide variety of games and a wide variety of users um, with a distributed network of data centers, um, you can actually achieve latency through the cloud, which is comparable to, to local graphics rendering. And we've got um, today we've got you know millions of users enjoying GeForce now and trying it, and it shows you that you know with with, with the technology is always going to catch up at some point, and you're going to be able to introduce new experiences that people couldn't do before. Yeah, that's um, th that's I, I love that you said that the necessity is the mother of invention. Um, that is um, a great example of why it's become so important to um, distribute the processing. And um, so does, uh, I mean, when we think about putting it into the cloud, um, how, how close does the actual rendering need to be to the end client to achieve the latency that would be expected of a gaming experience? Um, so I'm just thinking in terms of, okay, we've got the speed of light. <laughs> where does the edge, where does the processing need to take place? Is it is it at the edge? Um, how you know how far away uh, can the edge be from the end client? Any takers? Any thoughts? Um, None. <laughs> I, I I can take it too. I mean, uh, I don't want to. Good. I mean, we um you know we've been running our we ran a beta for cloud gaming for a, for a number of years, and um, we were trying to learn kind of what it was. And you know, we originally had this theory that. Um, it was all geo distance. Um, and so we would measure latency from clients um, from different distances to data centers. But as we found out, you know, the web is not just simply a straight line. It's not as the crow flies from you know, Los Angeles to Pasadena. It's a, it's a series of networks, almost like a road that have to, to, tra to, to go through. And there's, you know, there might be toll roads too, where you got to go through and it kind of slows things down. So um, there, there certainly is, there's kind of a limit. You know, we, we kind of look for people within, you know, 400 to 500 miles of a data center on average can generally achieve a really good experience. Um, and above and beyond that, um, it, start, it sort of tends to fall off. But even with emerging technology, we're seeing that people are so hungry sometimes for the experience that they're willing to live with some of the, um, uh, the limitations of that. And we've actually had a number of people trying to connect even as far away from Brazil into a data center in Miami, just because they, they crave the experience so much that they're willing to live with it until the technology catches up. You know, yeah, you can imagine if, if you take that thought and you move it into VR, let's say, um, if you end up with a, a significantly long uh, latency, it's not just a bad experience. It actually becomes nauseating, right? So there are some limits. So, so for a VR style of experience, you, you know, a total ping time on the network, you can hide a lot of latency with late latch, asynchronous time warp and such. But a, a total ping time of 20, 30 milliseconds is plus all the rendering, plus all the encoding, decoding. That's really your maximum latency that you can you can think of having a reasonable VR experience, d depending on the game, of course, or, mm -hmm. or the use case. Yeah, so, I, yeah just to add to that, like um, uh, I think it a lot depends on uh, the, the, the kind of the uh, uh, game that gaming experience you're looking at. Uh, you know, if you're looking at something like a, um, a first-person shooter kind of which a lot of motion factor, uh, yes, you need that edge to be as close as possible. But the, uh, most, uh, most of the games uh, today can actually be uh, done from uh, what is like that 20, 30 millisecond uh, network delay, uh, what um, um, Greg was kind of mentioning. But uh, I think when we, we, when we think of where the edge has to be, I think it's important, equally important to just see like what kind of games that we are trying to enable. Uh, so you'll never be able to enable all kinds of game. There'll always be something that will be left out, uh, which needs still a local experience. So, but it's all about how much can we address with uh, different configurations. Right, and then um, what about, uh, when I think about, um, you know, delivering content from the edge, I not only do I think about the application and the type of experience that um, like for a game, like you were saying, first person shooter game. Um, what about if you have uh, 
a different type of headset. I mean, we've, we're, th- we're learning now about uh, various types of, um, you know, headsets that are being tried out. Of course, it was Magic Leap and maybe Apple will have something. How, how does that um, affect the type of content you want to deliver if the headset is maybe able to um, consume something more than 2D video? Um, I, I, I understand that uh, Grid Raster is thinking about distributing point clouds. Yep. Um, does that, I mean, does distributing point clouds, is that much different than distributing video? Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty similar. Uh, uh, the thing is, uh, the way the way we l- look at the internet, like today, the way we see at the internet is this internet design today is primarily for consumption. But with the uh, with the immersive medium coming in, you are pretty much also looking at how the internet will shape up uh, for uh, production, like because you 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 will see enormous amount of data that's going to get fed into the network, and I think a lot of that is kind of driving this move uh, towards you bringing the compute function closer to the user to deliver those low latency experiences also. You're, you're, you're actually putting in humongous amount of data into the network. You don't really want to congest the um, core network. So that's the, you want to kind of process as much as possible closer to the uh, user to kind of provide that experience. The way we see it, you, you're going to see a kind of a hierarchy of compute that's going to kind of get built out. And there are experiences which you can actually run uh, uh, from the edge uh, there are experiences that can actually run even a hop beyond that, maybe uh, from a regional center. So it's important for us to kind of benchmark like which use cases uh, can be run uh, from where and can there be even within a, within an experience, even in a gaming experience, you can potentially have some of the task, uh, uh, you know, you can do the split rendering, you can actually do some task render closer and there are some tasks that you can actually render, um, uh, you know, uh, to a next half of the uh, of the compute, and still be able to bring together uh, both of them. And from a user experience, they still gets the best experience that is possible. It all depends on what is the latency budget, which is kind of available. And we know that it's it's going to be a trade off between the cost and the latency budget. Um, how you kind of going to distribute all these tasks and uh, enable those experiences. Yeah, and, and you can take that beyond graphics, right? So, yeah. So, a lot of what AR is is I'm going to deliver a graphic, but I'm going to I'm also going to deliver a lot of context about what that graphic means in my real environment. So, AR is layering context on that that that, that native environment. So, if I'm doing some inference to build that context, or I've got some deep learning tasks, the latency requirements for that inference may not be 20 milliseconds, you know, motion to photon. It may be 500 milliseconds. So I'm going to have these kind of nested latencies and, and places where, you know, with a, with a Qualcomm XR2 that's got a, a nice chip and you can do quite a bit of compute, I may finish a render there with raster. I may do some ray tracing at the edge and I may do some inference yeah. down in the data center and bring that whole package together with, with a reasonable time frame for each piece of information. Yeah, for something like an application like gaming today, what um, what we do is uh, we, we're traditionally working with existing game applications that haven't even modified their game code. They're just simply just putting their game directly into a, a virtual machine and then streaming it out. Um, and for us, obviously, our challenges are, uh, you know, you, you sit down to watch Netflix or Hulu or, or a video streaming service, and if you buffer a frame or two or if you, have, if you lose a frame or two over the course of the video, you probably, in the grand scheme of things, are never going to notice it. Um, but for us, with a, with a cloud gaming application where it's really about as fast as you possibly can go with the best possible network you can get, we're very sensitive to a lot of those things. And so things like having great edge networks or even you know working with the new network technology that can come out that can actually uh, improve packet tagging and make it even better, that's, that's going to be very beneficial to people that want to immediately take their game engine and put it in the cloud. Now, there will be obviously the future where we're... we're you know, we're seeing some game developers are interested in, in kind of rewriting how they're doing their game engine for the cloud. That's certainly technology that's going to come out and people are going to change that because they're going to realize they can render some things locally, uh, maybe a HUD, maybe uh, parts of their game menu, uh, but still do the massive lifting, the massive rendering in the cloud, uh, because that's where it's going to have the most processing for the device. And, that, you know, that's a it's a really good point is we, we talk a lot about latency and such, but as you introduced 
you know, more people into a network and you start increasing the jitter and the packets are a little misorganized and we have to buffer at the client to make sure we get the right frame and a quality frame and, and try not to drop frames. That is as big a latency cost as the network can provide, sometimes larger, right? So a lot of it is the quality of the network and, and how many users on that network. And as we try to, like, for instance, roll out 5G and scale per, per GPU or per compute at the pole, um, those technologies, those antenna technologies are going to be critical in, in, you know, maintaining good experiences. Yeah, we're sort of, we're even starting to see some of those technologies come out. I mean, we've, for GeForce now, we've partnered with um, telcos around the world. We've got, a, we're working with LG and SoftBank, uh, and LG in particular is starting to test their 5G network with cloud gaming. And it kind of is, it's starting to become this universal promise of, you know, great networking everywhere. Uh, and you can imagine walking around with a 5G phone um, and streaming like, you know, a VR application or, a, you know, high performance gaming application and not have to worry about, you know, do I have enough bandwidth? Do I have a fast enough connection? It, it's all that's there. And it's just simply waiting for the, uh, you know, it's almost kind of waiting for the uh, the experience to catch up with the technology. Yeah, actually, at Kudra, so we are kind of looking at, uh, I mean, uh, we, we talk a lot, a lot about 5G, but we are also have to be aware that uh, we also have a, you know, com competing technologies. Like if you are, uh, you're going to have a gaming experience in your living room, we know that the Wi-Fi 6 and others are kind of coming, right? I mean, you did not, like, you did not really have 5G to have those experiences within, in your living room. Right. But the 5G, the, the way we see 5G kind of uh, helping is like, it just makes it seamless, right? Whether you are at home, you want to continue your experience when you go out. I mean, it's just kind of seamlessly uh, happens. And in, in Grid Raster, we actually, the way we see this um, whole experience being enabled is you need to, there are a lot of optimization that you need to kind of do on the device side. There are many things that can be done on the device. There are many things that you can do over the network and there is optimization on the cloud. And this is an experience, the immersive experience is, uh, is an experience where you need to kind of stitch them also together uh, because the latency demands are so high. And, and some of those actually we are kind of addressing um, uh, in Good Raster, working with our customers, both in the enterprise and uh, with, with the telcos and the cable operators. Uh, and that I think that's going to be pretty critical uh, in terms of bringing those um, high-end gaming experiences as the infrastructure, as the uh, kind of technology, uh, network technology kind of evolves. So we talked about um, the, the, I mean, I think some of the points that you've all touched on is that, yes, you need the, the 5G, you need the, you know, the sophisticated mobile um, network technologies, but we're also going to need um, the same in order to make it seamless with uh, Wi-Fi and even the fixed networks. And so it seems like, um, you know, we're, we need to um, have the, all of the network technologies be ready to hand off and work together on delivering these um, sophisticated immersive experiences. Um, I'm wondering though, what about, um, what, I mean, is, are we going to be, because I'm such a video person, uh, I like to think about um, what comes next after um, 2D video and how do we get um, to the point where we're distributing more like six degrees of freedom content, maybe even, you know, we talked about ray traceable content. Um, how far away do you think we're there? Um, how far away do you think we are from, uh, you know, getting those networks to work together and delivering something beyond 2D video. Any thoughts? Well, I think we're yeah. closer than ever. And, and I mean, I think uh, the great thing about networking technology is no one has ever said, you know what, slow down. I've got enough yeah. bandwidth. I've got <laughs> enough latency. Yeah. Um, that's, right. that's never been a problem with networking. Everyone's trying to always make it better and trying to make it faster. And um, I think DJ even, you know, had talked about a little bit is, you know, things like Wi-Fi 6 and having the ability to, you know, prioritize packets and deliver, you know, QoS is a lot of that stuff as we've, we've learned too, as we've gone with, with, um, with like cloud gaming services is that, you know, a lot of the network operators, they would look at network traffic and say, we're going to prioritize voice traffic, or we're going to prioritize this type of traffic, which at the end of the day, do you really need to prioritize voice traffic? Because there's a slight de delay, probably not. 
Um, maybe sometimes you need it, like sometimes for mission critical applications. But for things like doing, you know, immersive graphics or, you know, uh, you want to do six degrees of freedom with a VR in the cloud, there's ways you can work with, you know, the different equi equipment manufacturers to actually prioritize all that packets and deliver QoS right for your service. And that, I think we're seeing, we've seen a lot of benefit of that. And we, we always see even, we, we see these these cases where people will say, well, you know, I've got a great network. Uh, you know, I work with my cable provider or my network provider, and they say I've got you know 300 megabits to my to my street. And then you see when they connect up their network in their house, they've got some you know cheap twenty dollar router that has no idea of intelligent packet <laughs> tagging or QoS. And so, right. you know, people are spending hundreds of dollars a month to great to get a great network, and they ruin it with this you know terrible router in their house. And so we've seen you know doing more efforts of working with router manufacturers can actually help improve that dramatically within someone's house. Yeah, you know, we, we demoed uh, Cloud XR, our, our XR streaming application at Mobile World Congress LA in last October. And we demoed that from an LA data center, a Verizon LA data center, streaming over the Verizon production 5G network onto the Samsung 5G phone. So that's a unique case because we had all those attributes downtown LA, but, um, you know, streaming six dot XR. We've we've done it on a production network and, and now really scale out. And there's gonna there's gonna be a lot of in home problems to solve. But um mm -hmm. you know the capabilities are are really close. And and it's finding the valuable use cases that will actually help, you know, fund the telcos to do all the CapEx spending they need to roll out those those networks. Yeah, uh, uh, for us, I think um, I, we we definitely kind of realize that there are, there are certain pieces of infrastructure that needs to fall in place. Uh, so that's the reason. Uh, uh, but uh, we started kind of uh, um, uh, going, uh, you know, at an enterprise level. That one of the good things is, uh, you know, you you have many of those infrastructure um, variables are pretty controlled. Like you you can get that dedicated uh, bandwidth. Uh, what we have done is like we we have gone ahead, kind of built with those uh, enterprises, and many of the uh, many of the uh, capabilities that we are building will ultimately scale up from a gaming point of view. Uh, like for example, if you are doing a simulation, uh, um, simulated training, hyper realistic simulator, a simulation training in in a defense or a aerospace environment with uh, a multiple uh, a multiple users, it's, it's almost like you're trying to replicate a, a multi-user gaming um, uh, scenario like in, in VR or in mixed reality. Uh, so we are building some of those building blocks, kind of uh, taking it to that and uh, trying to apply that with our uh, telcos and uh, cable operators. So uh, I, I think the in-home experience, we believe will take some time, but it's definitely going to happen. And the telcos and the cable operators see the uh, incentives and the potential there. So we, we are not too far off. Well, okay, so um, what about, I mean, we, well, we said, uh, I mean, I'm thinking about like delivering ray traceable content um, and uh, how, um, how, is that uh, a, an experience that um, the gaming community is, has quite an appetite for or is the, um, 2D Lambertian surface, you know, the, the older, I, I, I want to go back to maybe just the way, where we were 10 years ago. Um, is the uh, content, the type of content that's being um, delivered, is that going to be satisfying, you know, what the gamers want in the future? Like, um, I'm just curious about ray traceable content um so i, I can that, i can take that one we, we're yeah so the, great, the great the great thing i would say is there's a huge demand for ray tracing and i think people especially gamers they see it um you know mm -hmm. the the number one game in the world right now um is it, i think you know it's debatable what, what you call the number one but I'll, I'll say is one of the most popular arguably the most popular game in the world minecraft has decided that rtx is important enough to add to it and i think as people started seeing a game like minecraft adding rtx they all of a sudden they opened their eyes to something which they never thought was possible and they're you know personally for me i've only had a couple of times in my life where i've seen things and my mind has been blown um i remember the first time when i was in college my uh, my roommate in college was actually working on 
uh, GL Quake, if you can if you can imagine that. He was actually working on Glide at 3DFX. And when I saw it the first time, my mind was blown because I couldn't explain it. I just said, it looks better. I don't know why. I had no idea what graphics was. I just, my mind was blown. Um, right. And I've, I, I've had the similar reaction to people as they see RTX the first time. They, they're used to lighting a certain way and they're used to playing games a certain way. And then all of a sudden when they see the reflection of their player on the ground, on the water, on the wall, on the, on the car door, their mind becomes blown. They're like, wait a minute, I didn't, that's the real world. I, did, I thought games, you know, I'm used to reflections looking different. And so the, right. the, the great thing for us is we've actually we've actually started the transition for ray tracing in, in our data centers. So our <clears throat> our current GeForce Now data centers contain a mixture of um, you know standard uh, DX11 style graphics without ray tracing, but we do have a number of data centers now, all with our latest architecture, and we're streaming RTX today. Um, there's a there's a number of games out today which are streaming with RTX, and the great thing about something like that as a as a user is. You can continue to use the same device you're using today, whether it's a thin and light notebook, um, a tablet, a phone, um, a set-top box, whatever you want. You don't have to change anything to get RTX. It all happens in the cloud seamlessly without you. Um, so whatever whatever device you enjoy to you you know enjoy your content on today, you can just get it upgraded. Um, and we uh, you know we just work with uh, better compression, better encoding technologies to stream all that down to you. And, and then there are some interesting split rendering methods we're seeing. So Verizon, and they gave a talk at AWE, I think a year ago on this. So what they're doing with their edge appliance is, is they ray trace, they do a global illumination pass at the edge, turn that into some light probes, send that down to the device, let the device finish a raster render with that global illumination light probe information. And okay. so you're seeing a, a really nice environment. You're, you're using ray tracing. But now the ray tracing is being, being you know, split rendered and they're dividing the task. So there's a variety of ways and we're seeing ray tracing becoming more and more a piece of the six DOF experience in that case. And, mm -hmm. and so you ray tracing, you have, I'm from the University of Utah and we've been working on ray tracing there for 20 years. And so mm -hmm. it's really gratifying to see the graphics pipeline changing as it is today uh, with that RTX leading the way. It's really exciting to see the ray tracing get more and more. Uh, usage and, and that that just is the way graphics will be delivered in the future, I believe. Yeah, if you're if you're looking at kind of taking this experience as, as real as possible, I think ray tracing is absolutely integral to it. Mm -hmm. But we're not quite there yet, or or are we? Uh, um... yeah, in many cases, the capabilities are there now. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, when I when I think about our, when I think about ray tracing from the cloud, I look at it as we're there today, right now, in, in, for a service like okay. GeForce Now. We we have games streaming right now with RTX. We have more coming, and so uh, the capabilities there for people to to try and enjoy right now. And so um, uh, that is, I'm wondering though, is the is the content for the game, or um, is that any is that much more more difficult to deliver in terms of, you know, it's now more photorealistic, or is it um, with what you're saying now, uh, we're ready to deliver that today. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not being very articulate, but I'm thinking about what about the, the need for more um, AI to make that um, more photorealistic content is, um, is that it deployed at the edge and then are, are we, is it already available or do we still have a long ways to go? Well, I mean, we, we use artificial intelligence even today to do things like um, uh, we use it in the cloud to not only do, um, well, obviously you can do RTX in the cloud, but you, we also have technology called DLSS, which can actually um, does, uses AI to actually increase the image quality of scenes. Um, you think of it like anti-aliasing the cloud is the best way to think about it. And so you can actually um, use a high performance um, graphics processor to, to render effectively high resolution, better quality with your actual render resolution being less. Um, and so we're absolutely using all that technology that we can do. Uh, we're taking advantage, advantage of it in our data centers to be able to deliver that more immersive graphics and better looking quality for, for gamers. So is uh... Um, I, I don't know. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, Dijim, your thoughts about where we're, where we're at and how far we need to go to get to photorealistic content in, in gaming? Uh, I think, uh, no, 
Uh, the way at least the, the general agreed, uh, uh, you know, specification is you are looking at uh, 16K and uh, 120 frames per second. Uh, I, I'm sure like there is really a, a, some distance to go there, but we are closing in. I think we are already seeing 8K uh, with 90 frames per second. Uh, so I wouldn't say we are too far off. So uh, what about, oh, oh, go for, ahead. You know, for, for six DOF, you know, VR, two, two eyes, you have to deliver double the frames. Um, you know, things like foveated rendering, still eye tracking are gonna be, you know, critically important to, to yeah. get there um, for that full experience. So, but we're, but I think what you're talking about in this case though, is more about a head uh, mounted display. Yep. What about yep. for a multi-user experience, let's say at a fixed panel, a fixed display? Um, any differences there? And, and is it any more complicated? Well, it's, pro it's probably okay. similar, um, but I, may, I, th I think, like I said, it's a matter of finding the application for that. I mean, I think that technology for what you want to do is probably all there today. It's really finding that application of the split screen rendering for users. I mean, we've, we've, ex we've explored things like, you know, um, rendering a stereoscopic view and then split taking instead of rendering um, left and right views for um, one user into a single display, um, taking one view and sending it to one user and taking another view and sending it to another um, as doing interactive displays. And like I said, that's, you know, this, the idea of doing a stereoscopic left eye right eye view is very similar to VR technology, which can, you know, all be done right. today from the cloud. Right. And, and um, so, so in terms of technology, um, we seem to have all the bases covered. Um, do you, does anybody have any uh, thoughts or um, a vision into what some of the business challenges are? Um, I think when it, when it comes to uh, at least the, uh, the, the mixed reality, right, or even in, in VR, when you have the camera on, uh, I'm sure it's kind of capturing privacy is one of the, uh, one of the biggest concern and where that data gets stored, um, how it's being used. Uh, um, I think uh, they, are, they are going to be, uh, there are going to be challenges around that, but uh, what I, we firmly believe that the value uh, or the convenience that people will see uh, in this technology will kind of take care of it as, as is the case with most of the technology where those concerns has been there in the past. Mm -hmm. I think for us, you know, for the for on the cloud gaming side, you know, there's um, there's a lot of different models for how you handle games in the cloud. I know um, some people might be looking at it as it's a new platform, it's a new service, um, it's a brand new thing where game developers are, you know, potentially developing brand new games, and it's a new ecosystem, a new marketplace. And um, while that sometimes that may be good for um, some parts of the of the business model. Um, for consumers is not necessarily a good thing where you have to go out now and start a brand new marketplace, uh, you know, potentially brand new multiplayer servers where you're only connected to people on your service. And for our model, the way we look at the cloud is, um, and, and the way we try to model with game developers is, we don't want to change the economics of what you're doing today with your existing stores. You know, you put your game on Steam or you play or Epic Game Store or whatever it is. Um, you're establishing your price points, you're establishing your sales. We're just saying, put that in the cloud now. Um, you can still target all the pricing, all of the business models you have today, but we can open you up to lots more customers that for whatever reason, they, they don't have the processing power locally with their you know, thin and light notebook or their tablet or whatever reason. You're getting all these customers um, with you know, virtually no development. Um, and I think that's, that's in our vision is, and we call it, you know, bring your own games to the cloud. We don't want to we don't want to have to have you have developers, you know, completely re-architect their games for the cloud, and we want to let consumers play the games they they already are playing today. Right, Greg, do you have any thoughts about the no, business what, challenges? You know, the the business challenges. There's to build out, you know, these faster networks to build them out both in in corporations and for the public. There there needs to be some valuable use cases that. that mm -hmm to monetize and so we see that in enterprise quite readily and but it's you know we we've had a couple hype cycles on vr and xr and nar and mixed reality and but underneath those hype cycles we see a really nice organic growth right as people change their pipelines like auto manufacturers rely less and less on the clay model and more and more on immersive technologies to do design review and such 
we're seeing that organic growth and that those valuable use cases being created that really paved the way for the investment by the telcos and the network companies to build out these, these new networks to make these experiences even more robust from the cloud. So, so I right. think, you know, economically, we're seeing a really nice ramp into, into providing the foundation to build these, these capabilities we need to deliver these rich experiences. Yeah, I, I completely so, second that, yeah. So we're about out of time, but um, I just want to add, um, because from um, a really personal interest, I would love to see these gaming experiences become holographic. That would be a photorealistic holographic experience that I, I'm waiting for that. So, so gentlemen, you, you, I've laid out my challenge for you. <laughs> Make it friend. so. <laughs> Make it so. Okay, so um, I'll hand it back over to um, our uh, track chair to uh, give us the questions, if any, from the audience. Hey everyone, yep. incredible panel. You know, it, it's amazing that the questions that were asked in the uh, in the chat were actually questions that you guys uh, were able to talk about in regards to the impact of uh, enterprise uh, with, with these technologies, as well as how what, what is it going to take to get to the point that we can have large, you know, XR type experience, multiplayer experiences running running in this um, hardware. I think one thing that I'm really curious about is that you know. Technologies like 5G and a lot of this, these rendering technologies kind of exist behind the scenes, but there's this part of the technology that exists also in the front, the devices that are going to run this uh, technology. What do you think the kind of the, the meeting point of those of those technologies are? You know, we're getting ready to release 5G here in the United States. How long is it going to be until devices can actually support that and start taking advantage of, the, of these type of cloud rendering services? Yeah, I mean, there's devices out there now that, that are doing that. The, the Samsung 5G S10, uh, that's the, it's a production cell phone we ran our demo on at Mobile World. Uh, Qualcomm has their reference device out, so a VR headset with a 5G um, Snapdragon in it. And and so that's that's working now and, and is a great reference design for other HMD manufacturers to go off of. So the technology and the devices uh, there's not a lot of devices to stream to now, but the technology's out there. It's in production, and uh, and I think we'll just see it grow over the next few years. Yeah, I mean, as what, Greg what, said, is I mean, it, it, a lot of it even just depends upon even the the target you're going after. I mean, we've um, you know, a lot of people even with like gaming, for example, is uh, as I mentioned, is they have you know terrible notebooks, and we've even done demos where we've literally gone to Best Buy and bought 200 hour laptops, which I don't even, I don't even know what you could run on them. And, and it's to the point of where you can't even install a game because the hard drive is so small. And we've been able to show that you can take that $200 notebook and actually make it into a cloud gaming system. And the performance is on par with, you know, a standard gaming laptop. And you were, if you were to look at and play it and, and try to understand, you know, where is the rendering happened? A lot of people just don't even, it becomes seamless to them. They go, well, I, I don't even care if it's rendering in the cloud or locally. It just I'm playing this game and it looks great. Yeah, I believe you know the 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 cl the cloud and the the whole edge computing and five G uh, all that will be integral in terms of even those making those devices. Uh, uh, the design uh, it's easy to use. Um, you know they can just take it and snap it on and they just get into the experience. I think it's absolutely critical that we have all that infrastructure uh, been built out. Uh, there's a question. There's a question in the audience. Uh, I think this will be our last question. It's, how much of an impact do you see the new opt-in program for GeForce Now having the future of streaming content? I guess uh, the team Nvidia can probably best answer that. Sure. Uh, you know, so um, uh, a lot of what we're trying to do with the, the cloud, I talked about a little a little while ago, was um, just making sure publishers, uh, you know, can kind of control their business model from the cloud. And you know, like I said, our vision for it is that. Um, you know, gamers have existing stores they connect to, they have existing systems. And so there's already an e ecosystem of, you know, millions of users playing these games. And rather than trying to create a brand new ecosystem, we're saying, let's hook into those existing ones that are already there and let publishers establish their own business rules to decide, do they want to stream from the cloud or not? And that's kind of what we're trying to, trying to, trying to enable and allow is the publishers can now choose to participate in the cloud on their own and they can, they can opt in and control it all. And a platform like Steam is great for them. You know, Steam's been spending years on learning what publishers want. 
Um, you know, if you remember when Steam first came out, it, it was all about you had to submit your game to Steam. You had to wait for Valve to approve it, set it all up. And Valve actually started the self-publishing model, you know, a couple of years ago, where now developers can completely do anything on their own. They can upload their game build, um, choose when to go live, uh, work on sales. And the opt-in for them just means for the cloud now, they can just decide, you know, I want my game to be in the cloud. Um, I can open up and, and find more users for it with virtually no work on my site. Amazing. Well, great. We got, we got to keep moving along for the day. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, telling us all about the exciting future that's coming at the uh, at the edge with gaming and, and cloud rendering. Uh, hopefully, we'll hear more about this uh, next year at uh, AWE 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.